Okay, hi everybody and welcome to Stick Man. Uh, so what I'm going to do for you is uh, a presentation. It's basically a quick breakdown of step one as it's outlined in the big book about Cox Anonymous. I'm also briefly going to cover the other steps as well. Um, so in the big book of AA, it tells me I have a threefold illness. It says it's physical, it's spiritual, and it's mental. And we're going to start with the physical side. In the doctor's opinion, written by Dr. William D. Silkworth, he had this theory that alcoholics and drug addicts are allergic to drugs and alcohol. Uh, you know, an allergy is just an abnormal reaction to a common substance, anything I put in or on my body. My father has an allergy to shellfish, specifically to scallops. If he eats scallops, he and he'll go. To, he'll actually die. Uh, the last time he had scallops, uh, he was passed out in the bathroom for two hours, and the doctor said, "If you eat scallops again, your heart will stop." So guess what? Hasn't eaten scallops in 15 years. His body is different from mine. Right? And because if I eat scallops, nothing bad will happen. I can eat all the scallops I want. Now, I can't afford that, but you know, our bodies are different. And it's the same thing with drugs and alcohol. About 90% of the population, 80 to 90%, have a normal reaction to drugs and alcohol. Right? And we know these people. These are the people who can have you know, just one and a half drinks. Right? And then they leave that half a drink at the bar and go home. And I'm eyeing that, one, that half a drink before they even get it to a half. Right? These are the people who can do one line of cocaine at a party. Right? These are the people who can take one pill for you know, anxiety and then not do it again for six months. Right? They can do a shot of heroin on the weekends and not one anymore. But that's not my experience. My experience is what my, my allergic reaction is this thing called the phenomenon of craving. And the phenomenon of craving is like this. It's like once I put it in my body, I want more and I want more and I want more. It's a craving that's you know always intensified and never satisfied. Think on your own personal experiences. Have you ever tried to do this, you know, just an eight ball of cocaine for the weekend? Have you ever tried to just have a six pack? Have you ever tried to just take your pills as prescribed? And what happened? I know for me as a pill addict, I would uh, I had this plan that never seemed to work out. I would get two Oxycontin 80 milligram pills. I would eat half of one of those pills. And I would save the other one and a half for the next two days, right? So I have half a pill on Friday, one pill on Saturday, half a pill on Sunday. I, you know, I can go to work on Monday. I might be sick, but not too sick. And then I don't do pills again for another six months. But what happens? As soon as I put that half a pill in my body, suddenly this allergy gets kicked you know, kicks in. I get the phenomenon of craving. I want more. Suddenly I find myself out of pills two hours later and on the phone with the dope man trying to pick up some coke on the way. And once the phenomenon of craving develops in me, I go on something called a spree. A spree is just any continuous period of drinking or using. It can be a few hours, it can be days, weeks, months. My last spree was about nine months long. Um, you know, I know people have had spot, um, you know, sprees that are 30 years long. It can be a few days, it can be hours, so it's just any continuous period of drinking or using. In my case, my sprees usually don't end until I have some consequences. You know, uh, consequences can, can really vary in range. You know, I have uh, internal and external consequences. The external ones are the ones that are most noticeable, right? You know, DUIs, you know, overdoses, jail, rehab. Um, you know, hospitals, losing relationships, money, um, but these internal consequences are bad too, right? These are the ones that, that break me, where I just can't take it anymore, where I, I, I feel myself in these, uh, you know, deep pits of despair, you know, so I can have internal and external consequences. Now, once I have a severe consequence, and again, think on your own personal experiences. Have you ever had a major consequence as a result of drinking and drugging and said to yourself, all right, that's it, I'm done, I'm never doing it again? I know I have. And the book refers to that as a firm resolution. Right? And a firm resolution is just saying, I'm done, I'm never doing it again. And we mean it, right, when we make these firm resolutions, these solemn oaths. We're not lying to ourselves, we're not you know, making it up. When I came to in a jail cell after my second DUI, found out what I'd done, um, you know, I, made, I told myself, I am done drinking. I'm never doing it again, and I truly, truly meant it. And in that moment, I was sober. But, you know, I've made a lot of these firm resolutions while high and drunk. You know, I get, uh, you know, down to the last beer, down to the last pill, down to the last line, down to the last rock, and I say, okay, now I'm done. <laughs> I'm never doing it again, starting tomorrow. Right? Tomorrow I'm going to rehab. But tomorrow never seems to come. Right? The, the firm resolution never sticks, and here's why. The book tells me I have something called a spiritual malady. 
It's just a spiritual illness. It refers to my internal condition when I uh, am completely sober, right, and I have run out of drugs and alcohol, or they have been forcibly removed, as restless, irritable, and discontent. So what does that mean? What does that say? You know, that, that's really vague. Can we get more specific? How do you feel you know, when, when you have lost all your drugs and alcohol that have been taken from you? I know for me, I, I felt depressed. I felt very bored, constantly bored, no matter what was going on around me. I was always anxious or nervous. You know, I, uh, I had a lot of guilt and shame over the way I'd been acting. Um, you know, I definitely was angry. I was always, always very angry. Um, and I was lonely, you know. I felt like I could be in a room full of people and, and feel alone. And, and again, I could go on and on all day about how I feel, but really, I feel like garbage. I feel terrible. And here's the thing. I know how to fix the restless, irritable discontent, right? I have a solution to that. It's drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol are my solution to life. That's the, you know, that's how I get up in the morning. That's how I, you know, brush my teeth for the um, second time this week. You know, this is how I, I, I take the, the shower of the month. <laughs> you know, this is how I, I go to work. This is how I look people in the eye. This is how I, I, I have conversations with humans. This is how I don't hate everybody. You know, this has been my solution to life for a long time. The problem is I just had these major consequences. I just made a firm resolution. I really do want to stop getting higher drunk. So my mind tricks me into getting higher drunk again. And this is where the mental side comes in. I tell myself this great lie that, okay, I know things were bad last time. You know, I know I got a DUI last time. You know, I know the, the CPS took my kids away last time. I know that, um, you know, I, I wrecked my car. I lost my job. I spent all my money. I ended up in the hospital. I, I hurt somebody. But this time, it's going to be different. And here's how. This time, I'm going to control it. And... I'm going to enjoy it concurrently, and that is a lie, you know, it's total rubbish. I have never in my life had control over drugs and alcohol. Maybe some of you have, but I sure haven't. When I'm attempting control, when I'm counting my drinks, when I'm paying attention to the number of lines, when I'm doling out my pills one by one, I'm not having a good time. The only time I'm, I'm enjoying myself is when I'm getting the substance, whatever it happens to be, into my body as fast as humanly possible. And I know this. Intellectually, I can look back at my experience and I can say I have never, um, you know, for the, at least for the past you know, eight or nine years, had control over drugs and alcohol. And the plan never works. These two Oxycontin always turn into you know, Oxycontin for six months to a year. The plan doesn't work. I, can, I have never drank a six-pack. It has never happened. But, because this restless, irritable discontent is so bad, I'm willing to buy the lie. And I put it back in my body. And the circle, the cycle completes itself. The allergy gets kicked off again. The phenomenon of craving develops and I go on another spree. I have some more consequences which eventually stop being my consequences and become my truth. And my truth is, when I get higher drunk, I'm going to get DUIs. I'm probably going to have some sort of interaction with an officer of the law. You know, I'm going to end up in hospitals. I'm going to ruin relationships. I'm going to spend all my money. I'm going to wreck cars. This is my truth. Right? Everyone's truth is different. Your truth doesn't have to be mine. A lot of people don't have the same external consequences that I've had. It's those internal consequences you have to think about. You know, and, and the book tells me I have two questions I have to answer. If I'm an alcoholic or a drug addict. If when I honestly want to, can I quit entirely? Or if when drinking or using, can I control the amount I take? Well, my answer is no to both those questions. Maybe you guys are like me. So I get some truth, sober up, make a firm resolution, feel like hell, lie to myself, put it back in my body, and this just goes over and over and over. This is, um, this is insane. This is crazy. You know, this is like if my father went out today, got a bunch of scallops, and ate them, and died. And everybody would be at his funeral going, oh my gosh, what a tragedy. And I would be mad as hell going, this is no tragedy, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> he knew damn well what would happen if he ate scallops, and here he is, and he went and ate scallops and died. What a moron. And yet, that is how normal people look at us. They see our behavior and they say, you 
got your kids taken away by CPS, and yet here you are smoking crack again? You, you, got, you have how many DUIs? Three DUIs? One wasn't enough? You had to go for two and three? You wrecked your car and almost killed somebody? You went to jail for two years? And yet, here you are on pills again? Again? It's insane. It's crazy. If anybody can identify with this, I know I can. Right? And when I saw this presentation, I realized that I was hopeless. But more than that, I realized I was doomed. And this is how the book describes my condition. Not one, not two, but three doctors refer to our condition in the big book of AA as hopeless and doomed. Right? And when I think of the word doomed, I think like meteors falling out of the sky and <laughs> demons crawling up out of holes in the earth and, you know, horrible, horrible things happening. End of the world. But that's how they describe us. But I don't come here today because we we're hopeless and doomed. Obviously, I was wrong because I stand here before you today, you know, two and a half years sober. What I found out and what I've come to tell you is that there is a way out. And it's a higher power. And this was not something I wanted to hear. <laughs> you know, I'm not stupid. You know, I, I could tell by seeing these arrows that there was no way out except, you know, getting sober. And I can never stay there for very long. And, and, and by the same token, I knew that higher power meant God. And that was not a word I wanted to hear. I'd been an atheist since I was 24. Um, I was extremely agnostic when I came to this program. But I knew something had to change. The higher power treats the spiritual malady, it treats the restless, irritable discontent, and gets it down to a manageable level so that I don't buy this lie anymore. Now that's not to say I don't get restless, irritable discontent today, but I have spiritual tools that allow me to deal with it in a healthy manner. I don't have to get high today over getting angry in traffic. I don't have to drink over my, an argument with my girlfriend. Right? I don't have to snort cocaine you know, over a project that went poorly. Today, I rely on my higher power to stay sober because the higher power doesn't just treat the spiritual malady, it treats me mentally, right? And I don't buy this great lie anymore. I'm a recovered addict and alcoholic today. I've recovered from this mental obsession, you know, and that's what we offer. You know, I used to wake up, as soon as I woke up, what did I hear? I gotta get high, gotta get high, gotta get drunk, gotta get high, gotta get high, gotta get high, gotta get drunk, gotta get high. Today I wake up and, and, and I don't have those thoughts and I haven't for a good time. You know? And it's crazy to me, but that's how it works. Today I didn't think about getting high and I didn't have to think about how not to get high. I didn't have to avoid people, places, and things. I can go wherever I want as a free man. Right? And that's all through this higher power. But the problem was I was blocked off from my higher power. I was blocked off by things like you know, resentment and fear, my character defects, and my unmade amends, right? The way I've been living my life, the people I've been hurting, and these interior things that were tearing me up day by day. And so the steps helped me to get rid of these blockages to a higher power that I needed to recover from a hopeless condition of mind and body, from a disease that was killing me slowly but surely. And so I did steps one, two, and three, and I kind of broke this little pathway through all those blockages. My higher power was able to come in and give me some hope. But I wasn't done yet. I had a lot more work to do. You know, step one, all I had to do was admit that I was <laughs> hopeless uh, and, that, and that my life clearly was unmanageable. That, that was no surprise to anyone. And, and step two, I just had to believe that this could work for somebody else. You know, God didn't even enter into it. I just saw it working in the lives of others, and I was intrigued. And step three... I just made a decision that I would complete the rest of the steps. Again, God didn't enter into it. In steps four and five, I looked at my resentments, my fears, and other behaviors, and I shared them with another human being, and they were removed. In steps six and seven, I looked at my character defects, the things that I discovered, the patterns in my behavior from four and five, and I turned them over to my higher power. And then in steps eight and nine, I made a list of all the people I had harmed, and I began, began the long process of making amends to all of these people. And once I had done all that, once I had even begun, made my first three amends, I had this spiritual awakening. My heart power was able to come in, treat this restless, irritable discontent, get it down to a manageable level. I stopped buying the lie, and today I am happy. 
and that is something that I have not had, you know, in, for 26 years. Today I'm sober, and I'm happy while I'm sober. And that's a miracle because my experience with sobriety was that it sucked. It was restless, irritable discontent. Why in the world would anyone want to be sober? I understand it, but today I am sober and I'm happy, and, I'm, and I, I promise you that's true. If that sounds good to any of you, please come talk to one of us afterwards, and we'll get you hooked up with somebody that can sponsor you. Thank you.